Hey friends, Irene Line here. Welcome to this video, to this YouTube channel, and to this world of healing trauma, nervous system health, and all things neuroplasticity. One of my favorite ways to teach difficult concepts around uh, the nervous system and healing trauma and getting into the, the physiology environment is via example. And so I wanted to share an example that I have used numerous, numerous times in my teaching arenas with my students on podcasts that I'm on, online summits. I repeat it over and over again. So I thought I'd document it here so that you hear this example. And I'm going to talk about it in relationship to how we as human beings tend to numb ourselves out or dissociate or go into what's called functional freeze. So functional freeze is a concept that I learned through my mentors and teachers in the world of somatic experiencing and somatic practice. And in a nutshell, what it means is we are numbing out, we're shutting down, we're disconnecting from our body, our internal physiology, our sensations, our emotions, our life force energy. We're shutting down, we're numbing out, but we're staying functional. And by that I mean, is that if we go into a survival response, so if we think about fight, flight, freeze, so fight is attack, flight is get the heck out of this dangerous situation, and freeze is a way of describing a, a person or an animal, a mammal, um, or an animal that goes into kind of this shock state and they can't move, they can't fight, they can't flee, they can't think, um, and all of their metabolic processes just kind of goes on on halt, on standby, and everything drops in a sense. Blood pressure drops, heart rate drops, everything goes into the core. And it disallows us to fight and flee. When all of our blood goes to our core, our extremities can't do what they need to do to do these actions of defense and flee. So when we go into a freeze response, Sometimes we might go into such an extreme one that we are completely in shock. We, we can't move. Um, we might pass out. This, these are all signs of going into that high level of, of shutdown. It's called dorsal vagus shutdown um, of the parasympathetic nervous system. Dorsal vagal, I should say. It's part of the vagus nerve that keeps us safe. But what's interesting is that for many of us humans, we are not fainting every single moment of the day. We aren't stuck in bed and we are out in the world doing things and yet we live with this sort of sense, this quality of being shut down, of being frozen, of being in this functional freeze. So I'm going to paint a picture of one specific type of incident that we could use to extrapolate to all sorts of bad, scary things that happen to us when we are young, when we may not get the time and the care and the connection to come out of a stress response in a way that is, we could say, wholesome, safe, and allows our survival responses to express and expel naturally so that they're not stuck inside of us. I wanted to read a quote before I get into this example. This is from Robert Scare, who wrote the book, The Body Bears the Burden and also Trauma Spectrum. And he wrote in one of his books, I can't remember which one, but he said, unfortunately for our species, so the human race, um, humans, for our species, unfortunately for our species, our cages are often cultural and of our own making. So our cages as human beings are cultural and of our own making. And he uses that to depict how animals in the wild, and one of my uh, uh, teachers who I've studied with, the work of Peter Levine, somatic, somatic experiencing, he would often say that there's a reason why animals in the wild do not end up getting PTSD and humans do. Our cages are not actual cages, it's culture, it's conditions, it's programming, it's how we were taught by parental structures and other structures that are still working from a trauma response or from a perspective of being disconnected and not attuning properly. So here is an example. So imagine uh, a five-year-old or a six-year-old, it doesn't really matter what age, a child, a young child is learning how to ride their bike. 
And um, I, know, I know not everyone in the world had the fortune to learn how to ride a bike when they were young, but I will make a generalization that most people watching this have at some point learned how to ride a bicycle or something that requires skill and also the potential threat of falling and hurting ourselves. We could even put this to, you know, running with friends on a playground and we trip and fall and we scrape our knees. So let's just say we're riding a bike or we're doing something active and as a child we fall, we hit the pavement, we scrape our knee, we scrape our elbows, blood comes out, it hurts, it stings, um, and there's this instantaneous feeling of um, something's not right, I feel intense sensation, and if you've ever been with a little one and they really smoke themselves and they scrape, you know that it's really bad when they don't immediately get up. They kind of lay there and then if you wait long enough, there is this wailing, this crying, this redness in the face. Now, granted that it's safe, so let's just say little Susie trips or falls off of her bike, she's face planted on the pavement, she's definitely broke skin, she's really upset. Granted it's safe and she's not on a road and we need to scoop her up and get her to the sidewalk or to grass, let's just say she's safe. She is gonna go through this physiological response of feeling a lot of intensity. I'm not sure if you have scraped your knee or broke skin on pavement recently, I did a few months ago, and it reminded me how much that hurts and how much energy and sting and emotions, like maybe you did something that you shouldn't have, maybe you weren't paying attention and you got hurt because of your lack of awareness to the environment. So as an adult, there might be a little anger, a little bit of shame, a little bit of humiliation. But when we think of a child who's maybe never experienced pain like that, Imagine this for a second, brand new human being in the world, they've never felt that level of, of harm because let's just say they actually had a really good home life. No abuse, no verbal abuse, no intense toxic shame. They're on their bike, they fall, they hurt. If the response from the primary caregiver is to allow that little one to feel the pain, to cry bloody murder and let it all out, if that is being allowed with the caregiver just being there without interfering with their biological process. So I'm gonna give you scenario A, which is how we might want this to occur, how I would suggest this occurs. They fall, they're safe, we come to them, we put ourselves into a place where they know we're there, but we're not meddling you know, that word meddling, we're not meddling with their somatic experience, with their emotion, with their anger, with the snotty nose and the redness. We let them feel the waves, the tsunami waves of emotions. And then when they naturally orient to look for us, because they will, because this is part of how mammals, uh, specifically, especially humans, when we get into the situation where we're hurt, we have to feel that wave, that stressor, whatever it might be. And then when that has settled, if you can imagine an ocean with lots of lots of uh, waves and, and just crazy motion, when that settles, when the wind stops and the waves stop, all of the sediment will go down to the ocean floor and it'll be clear again. So if we imagine this little person, little Susie is crying, but she's given the time to really feel and sense when her system has come out of that activation, so I'm using my hand to depict this high activation, intense, she comes out of it. As soon as she senses that settling, there is a natural spontaneous orientation that she will do to look for her primary caregiver, to look for her brother, her sister, her grandma, her auntie, whomever. And when they look, and that adult or older person is there to connect, the person that's connecting, let's say the older adult that's connecting, their job, our job, is to let whatever it is that they need to have happen, happen. So perhaps they reach out to us, we then grab them. Perhaps we see them and they start to cry even more, we let them do that. We let them have the experience while containing it. And by doing that, 
they get out these incredibly intense experiences out of their system. And then, you know, as time moves on, some discussion, what we would call social engagement, um, which is part of our nervous system that allows us to connect and have empathy and it actually helps bring heart rates down. So we might socially engage, we might say something like, hey, wow, that was, that was pretty big. I'm here, you know, how are you doing? Depending, of course, the age of the infant or the child, you would change the, the script and the dialogue based on their level of maturity and comprehension, right? If this is a two-year-old that just smacked themselves because they were learning how to walk, we might, have, we might not have the same kind of conversation as say an eight-year-old or even a nine-year-old or a six-year-old. So this is where we have to course correct as the big person to know what that little one or not so little one needs to feel safe and nurtured and connected. So let's just say that's scenario A. One of the things that often occurs, and of course there's many infinite possibilities, is little Susie falls and before they even have a chance to feel the intense wave of heat and emotion and the scrape and the pain and the sting, they are scooped up immediately before they have a chance to feel, deactivate and orient naturally. They're scooped up in a sense of disorientation and intensity and they're not allowed to feel. And there's often something that we will hear people say, which is, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, it's okay, it's okay, you're okay, you're fine. And there's this panic, if you will, this the activation in the caregiver gets high as well because of their fright and fear for what just occurred. And this is where, as adults, we have to become very mature emotionally ground ourselves so that we're not adding more fuel to the fire, so to speak. So if we scoop them up and out of well intention, right? This isn't because this, this person is trying to shut that little one's emotions down. They're just worried themselves. And so in that process of worry and wanting to make sure they're okay, it disrupts the natural process of deactivation from that stress response. Now I'm gonna put one caveat to this and I already mentioned it. Let's just say little Susie fell and she clearly um, injured herself badly. Like let's just say the bone breaks in half and there's an artery spurting out blood. In that case, and this is where we have to use our judgment, by all means scoop the kid up, put a tourniquet around the, the arm, the leg, the limb, call 911, get a first responder in there and then of course, how you work with the trauma that's stuck after happens after their life is safe. But I'm talking about a general scrape, a bruise, um, something that isn't life-threatening. I hope that makes sense. So in that instance of scooping them up before they're ready to appease, to please the caregiver, they may see the terror and fear in the parent or the caregiver's energy and their emotions and they will immediately try to micromanage and shift their internal experience so that the person they're with i.e the caregiver comes down in their physiology and this my friends is one little drop into how us humans start to functionally shut down how we start to numb and it isn't cognitive the kid isn't saying i better shut down so that um, I don't feel this. It's just this natural biological response so that they don't um, have more intensity from the caregiver. So again, this is like we could say the scenario B, the scooping up really quickly out of good intention. Now I'm gonna point, paint another scenario which is similar, but let's just say without well intention, but with ill intention. So little Susie falls, she, the moment she starts to wail, there is this very strong, toxic, shaming voice of, how could you be such an idiot? Um, I'm being quite harsh with my words here, but how can you be so stupid? You know better than that. Come on, get up. You're a big girl or you're a big, big boy, of course, depends what the, you know, who the child is. Show your brother or your siblings or you're better than that. You can do this. Just like push through, get on that bike and keep on riding. Now, of course, you know, it might seem odd to think that someone would do that to a five-year-old or a three-year-old or 
gosh, even a two-year-old who smacks their face on the concrete when they're learning how to walk for the first time. But let me just say, I have heard things from clients and students that I can't believe occur and they do. So let's just say this is scenario three, little person falls. It's an honest mistake. They're learning how to use their bodies and immediately their pain of the experience, the, the bloody elbows, the bloody knees, the sting, the intensity, the scariness of not knowing what this pain is, it's immediately attacked with this venomous, poisonous, harsh, energetic, these words that say, you just really screwed up and you shouldn't have. And what this does is it doses out this toxic shame. So not only is this little one getting that, they're also getting this quality that this isn't right. I just did something wrong and I better change myself and I better not feel what I'm feeling because if I allow myself to express this intense pain, I'm gonna get in more trouble. And so we button it up. We depress, literally, we suppress the emotion, the pain, the feelings, that desire to cry to mom or dad and be hugged and soothed. Maybe we reach out and we just want help. We just want, we just want the parent to tell us we're okay and safe because we're not sure if we are at that young age. If they don't get that, that is the start of an individual not trusting the environment, not trusting themselves and essentially putting themselves into this functional freeze because that isn't going to, usually that's not gonna make a little one go into catatonic dissociation and pass out completely. They will keep living because human beings are very malleable, we're very adaptive, we will adapt so that we can stay safe in our family system. However, if that happens once, the scenario C or even the scenario B, it probably means it's going to keep happening. Whether it's the school report card that doesn't show straight A's, whether it's the fact that we, uh, you know, cut a vegetable wrong when we were learning how to cook as a young child, whether it was how we tied our shoelaces differently. Heck, children that wrote with their left hands back in the day were forced and scolded and had to write with the, the right hand. Um, there are so many ways in which we do these things to our little ones and it slowly starts to put them into what we would call this functional free state. It numbs out their ability to listen to their body because it was never, it was never allowed, it wasn't okay. And typically, I'm gonna generalize here, but typically the reason why those two scenarios happen, B and C, is because the caregiver, the adult, um, the school teacher, it doesn't have to be a parent, they don't know how to process their own activation. And so when we think about raising young humans, it's so important, in my opinion, to have other humans who are mature and who can see really, really scary stuff happen and stay grounded and stay connected. And if we can't, then we, I believe, have to do our work so that we are not adding, as I said a second ago, more fuel to the fire when our little ones are activated and need help deactivating. This comes back to the idea of self-regulation. A three-year-old, a five-year-old, a six-year-old, they still don't know how to self-regulate, especially if they had that energetic dysregulation from a caregiver from a young age. They are craving that regulation, that co-regulation. From scenario A, where I explain little Susie falls, we give her space, safe space, we contain it, we don't meddle with what she's feeling with. When that activation comes down, she will naturally spontaneously look for us. That is our cue as the big person to go in then and do whatever it is that they need so that they can feel safe and they can find their regulation through our regulation. So to rewind back to sort of the original um, thesis, if you will, of this video, I wanted to describe a real simple scenario, this child, you know, falling off of a bike or, or running and falling on pavement, scraping their knees, their ankles, feeling the pain, the, the sensations, the intensity. And what occurs after that is how many of us were taught whether or not it was okay 
or not okay to feel what we were feeling and then further to that how we were treated how we were taught how we were co-regulated will teach us whether or not we can feel all that intensity with full activation with full you know intensity and stay connected to that intensity but stay contained and safe so we can come out of it and we don't numb out dissociate and go into functional freeze as adults let's just say you maybe have a hunch that this is something that you experience that this happened to you maybe as an adult you know when you stub your toe or you trip on the sidewalk and you fall or you stumble you pretend it didn't happen you don't allow yourself to show vulnerability to show pain um, whether it's in relationship to what you do with the environment or if you are with other people whether you're watching a movie and you hold in the tears because you don't want to show emotion in a movie theater we start to trace and find all these ways that as i went back to this quote how our cultural our species our cages are cultural right and i think i know from working with my students and myself and my knowing my friends and my colleagues the more we can start to work with these held responses, the way we were put into these functional freeze patterns, when we can start to see as adults how this plays out and we can start to tease them apart, this is one way that we can start to heal at this nervous system level and get more connected to our bodies. And when we're more connected to our bodies and our somatic experiences and how they relate to the environment, this is how we grow capacity. And this is how all the old toxic junk and yuck that we have stored starts to bubble up and out. Um, so whether you are uh, healing for yourself as an adult, whether you have young children, whether you have um, grandchildren, whether you're a school teacher, whether you come across a kid on the street and they just happen to fall you know, and you don't know what to do. I hope this video has given you a few um, tips and tricks and hints as to what occurs in the physiology, how to contain what's happening, how to let that activation be active and let it deactivate so that that individual, whether it's an adult or a little one, because this works too with adults that you might find who've just hurt themselves, you know, on a trail or on, on in a city area where they trip and fall, it all applies. So to review, let the activation be there. Let the intense somatic experiences be there. Make sure that they're safe, right? So there's no more harm coming in and wait for that to come up and out. Assure them, the person, the child, they have all the time in the world, give it to them. And when that tsunami of activation has come down, that individual will then be more able to orient to the environment, to reconnect with their self, and they won't be trapping all of that survival stress inside. All right, that's it for today. I hope this has been useful. I hope this has given you some other insights into how the survival stress works, how we go into these functional freeze, dissoci dissociation and numbing out patterns. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. If you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, do so um, somewhere uh, after this. There'll be a little thing that you can click on, subscribe so that you get all notifications when new, new videos come out. Thank you so much for being here and we will see you next time. Hey, it's Irene. Quick note before you go, I want to make sure you know about my upcoming enrollment to my 12-week online curriculum called Smart Body, Smart Mind. I will say that one more time, Smart Body, Smart Mind. This is my online nervous system rewire and regulation program that my team and I have been running for many years. This will be the 13th time we have run this powerful online curriculum with people all around the world. So I wanna make sure you know about the upcoming registration that will be mid-February for a short period of time and we will start the live session end of February, 2023. It's a three month curriculum and it is life changing. So if you would like to do the work with me, and this is exactly where we do the work, deeper theory, practices, teaching with me live, Q&A sessions with my expert colleagues, this is what you wanna do. I want you to learn about it now so you have plenty of time to ask questions and make a non-survival based decision on joining this year. Somewhere near this video will be a link to that information page. Be sure to check that out and ask questions. If you have any questions, you can post one 
below this video or send us an email support at irenelyon.com.